All right. Hello, everybody. So our next talk is how to communicate with non-security specialists to drive action. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Ashley Lee. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley. I am Senior Product Marketing Manager at Jupiter One, And um, I've been doing marketing for over a decade now, the last seven years in cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, in the four and a half years that I was at Now Secure, which was my previous gig, I observed a rather unnerving cycle. And maybe you've experienced this too. Basically, our pen testing team would scope out a project with a client. They would spend several days testing their mobile app. Then they would spend several more days, maybe a week or so, uh, compiling that report of the findings and suggested courses of action. They'd have some calls with the client to figure out the uh, best course of action, do some more explanation and whatnot. And after a period of time, they would send back a new app binary to test. And lo and behold, what would they find? The pen testing team would retest it and they'd find a lot of the same findings, if not more. Now, for someone who was attracted to cybersecurity in the first place, uh, to, with the mission to defend and to protect against threats, it really boggled my mind that customers would be okay with uh, leaving in weaknesses that would expose customer data, like payment data, PII. It was really mind boggling for me. Um, what was the point of fixing or finding all those weaknesses without fixing them? So when I moved on to Jupiter One in 2020, I found that that cycle wasn't specific to mobile app security. In fact, that cycle of finding but not fixing, knowing but not doing anything about it, uh, that hit a lot of other domains, whether it's network configurations, cloud resources, device management, you name it. Why were these issues not getting resolved? Well, it turns out that people who find issues are not the same people who have the means to fix them. The people who find security gaps are not the same people who own those systems. So as a result, we've seen in recent years a rise in security trainings, a rise in security awareness, security champions programs, and it's all to put knowledge in the hands of the people who actually have the means to fix it. But even then, in the latest Verizon report, the data breach uh, investigations report, they found that 74% of breaches were still involving the human element. So even though knowledge is in the hands of people, you still have to convince them, persuade them to act. We've got a lot of work to do, and I'm here to help you not feel like this. So when you are communicating to a non-security specialist, there are three things that help you communicate to drive action. You provide value, you be extremely clear, and you connect with your audience. Now, uh, how you do those three things, provide value, be clear, connect, it's gonna be different for when you connect with engineers versus finance, sales, HR, uh, executives, engineering, um, interns, you might be, you know, con uh, convinced that you should do it in a big group, right, for efficiency purposes, because there's only so many of your, t so much of your time to spend. Um, but the reality, coming from a marketer, if you are specific with your audience, the more specific you are, the more likely you're going to be able to drive action. So let's take the first one, value. When you are thinking about value, uh, you have to obviously think about it in the context of your audience. And there are seven reasons why people care to read or listen to anything in general. First thing is novelty. Is it new or original to them? Counterintuitive, does it go on against their expectations? Counter narrative, does it go against a strongly held belief that they have? Or does it reinforce a belief that they already have? Maybe it sparks controversy or debate. Maybe it induces fear. Or 
maybe it's just a simple rankings or a listicle that is really easy to scan and consume. Just a side note, listicles tend to be really good for executives because they don't need all the detail. Now, aside from value, the other two pieces of connecting and being clear, those uh, are best captured in a quote by Katsuo Ishiguro. Katsuo Ishiguro was the Nobel Prize winner of literature in 2017. And in his acceptance speech, this quote goes, stories are about one person saying to another, this is the way it feels to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Does it also feel this way to you? Stories are about one person saying to another, this is the way it feels to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Does this also feel this way to you? Oops. The first part here is clarity. Can you understand what I'm saying? Communication, persuasion, influence, they all start with this basic question. Can you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Is it clear what I'm trying to convey? And the second part is connectedness here. Does it also feel this way to you? This is what makes stories powerful and memorable. It's the power of connecting on an emotional level because we as human beings build trust and relationships with that emotional connection. The way security practitioners relate to and comprehend technology is going to be very different from how non-security specialists relate to technology. So as subject matter experts, it's our duty to be able to connect with our audience and be able to connect the dots between why a policy change or change in their behavior is important in their context. Remember, always keeping your audience in mind. So uh, clarity and connection. These are the two basic components of any storytelling. Now, the biggest hurdle that I see is clarity. Too often we rely on technical terms that become jargon, misused by media, by marketing people, by salespeople, and the reality is jargon's a problem for any technical field, whether it's engineering, finance, legal, sciences. There are entire programs dedicated to the art and practice of communicating technical terms and technical fields to the common everyday regular person. Think for a second, how many brilliant PhDs do you know that are also great communicators? Tends to be an exception to the rule, right? To be both a technical expert and a great communicator. And that's because the skills to get to their level of expertise are very different from the skills you need to be a good communicator. Technical people like yourself use precise, specific words in your roles because it matters. Ambiguity costs time, it costs money, it costs your sanity. But in order to drive action across other business units, across other people in your life even, we've got to use simple common language to connect with those people. These people also have their areas of expertise, right? They may not know the ins and outs of multi-factor authentication, but they just need to know that it's gonna save their butt one day, right? So to that end, we gotta use simple common language. So to that end, I'm gonna give you two free tools to help with clarity. First one is the de-jargonizer. I actually learned about this last year from Carrie Tomlinson. Uh, she presented on this at RSA last year. So the de-jargonizer is a de-jargonizer, which I'll show you in a second on how to use it, and the Hemingway app. So to uh, demonstrate how to use these two tools. We're gonna use a definition from uh, NIST. This is the definition of MFA from NIST. It goes like, an authentication system, if I can read this, that requires more than one distinct authentication factor for successful authentication. <laughs> Multi-factor authentication can be performed using a multi-factor authenticator or by a combination of authenticators that provide different factors. 
The three types of authentication factors are something you know, something you have, something you are. It's probably not the best idea to use the word you're trying to define in the definition, right? So when we drop this definition into the dejargonizer, you'll notice that it highlights the likely culprits of jargon. Orange is that mid-range, it's used, but it's not used uh, too infrequently. Red are your real culprits of jargon. This tool also gives you a meter reading. So it counts how many words there are, it ranks the, the commonality of your words. Um, and studies have shown that Readers need to understand 98% of the vocabulary in a text in order to comprehend it. So that means rare words should be less than 2%, and in this case, no rare words. Now let's drop this into the Hemingway app. Hemingway app, uh, you can see that it is highlighted as such. It's a tool that helps with readability. So what grade level does somebody need to have in order to understand this text? Any guesses? Eighth grade. Any other guesses? Postgrad. You need a postgrad degree in order to understand this particular definition. We've got to do better than that. So here's an example of a simpler explanation. Um, this is I actually presented a similar topic. We talked uh, to other marketers believe it or not, because they have problems with jargon too, um, on how do you describe multi-factor authentication in a simpler way that isn't using all the jargon that marketers have relied on. So this is one of the ones that were uh, provided. Multi-factor authentication is how you prove who you say you are using something you know, something you have, something you are. And when you drop this into the two tools, you can see our meter reading for the dejargonizer is in the green. Uh, we have no rare words and it's at a grade seven level reading. So with this, we're able to actually appeal to a wider audience. Uh, but this is only to get to clarity. We still have to connect with our audience, right? So on that end, connection. The most logical person that you know will probably still be prompted to act off of emotion. So you just gotta connect with them. I have two books here that I recommend on how to connect with your audience. And it's gonna be specific to who you're talking to, but both of these books give you tools, tactics on how to improve and listen well. So, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This is a timeless book. It is decades old, but it is still applicable. It gives you tools on how to communicate with folks, how to get other people to uh, see your perspective and even jump on board if you ha even if you have opposing goals. The second book there, Never Split the Difference, by Chris Voss, he is a hostage negotiator, or was. Um, he has this concept of the black swan, and uh, the black swan is essentially the motivation behind the motivation behind the motivation uh, of why somebody's acting the way they are. People will tell you that there's a reason why they're choosing not to turn on MFA for their accounts. but. If you dig a little bit, if you use the tactics in his book, you're able to kind of uncover what is the real hurdle that's blocking them from performing that security measure. Okay, so we've covered all three, value, clarity, connection. I wanna take you back in time to 2017. I just finished uh, and passed my exam for the Marketo Certified Expert. And this was when the exam was still hard. And it's probably the equivalent of the AWS uh, Certified Solutions Architect exam. I walked into the room for the next talk, riding the high of passing that exam, settled in for the talk, and it was by Holly Rollo, who was the CMO of RSA at the time. There were seven other people in the room. And I remember exactly where I sat. It was second row, second seat, on the right section. It felt empty and intimate all at the same time. The presentation started off the way that most do. 20% this, 35% that, three out of five people do this wrong, 74% of breaches are attributed to the human element. But then all of a sudden, it felt like Holly was talking directly to me. 
She knew three things about her audience. One, we all had the keys to do some serious damage with our customer data, or we managed somebody who did. Two, we liked our sparkly technologies that inevitably held customer data. And three, we us marketing operators did not give significant thought to security measures like MFA. Now, as she wove, knowing her audience, those three different aspects, she brought her message home and said, don't be that person. Don't be the reason your customer data gets stolen. You better believe that I turned on 2FA and I rechecked all our user permissions after that session. And the reality is I had heard that fear-inducing message before, but what actually drove me to act? It was her extreme clarity and connection with her audience, with me, that helped me understand why security measures made sense in my context. It made a difference. So I'm gonna leave you with this. People wanna do the right thing. You just gotta inspire them to do it, right? They just need to know what it, security measures mean in their context. And you can inspire them by using these three pieces of communication that drive action. Value, clarity, connection, and always keep your audience in mind. Thank you. We got time for questions, I think. Mike, right behind you. So once you've gotten your message, once you've gotten your message across and you're motivating people to do things, how do you track their progress and follow up with them in a way that doesn't seem like you're punishing them or you're a parent talking to a recalcitrant child? That is a great question. I would say part of it has to do with the relationship that you're building with them, right? Um, if you are chummy with folks, you can totally joke with them in a way that they can receive it, but then also message received that I better get on that task. Um, but also sometimes it's okay to be direct and be like, hey, I've also tried to tell you this. It's been how long? What's, what's, the, what's the hurdle, right? And, use some of the tactics from uh, Never Split the Difference to kind of hear out, oh, are there other priorities that are pushing this down? Are there maybe technical things that they don't understand? Are there, you know, there's a number of different reasons why somebody may not be doing it. Maybe they just don't, they feel crushed in their job, right? And they just need someone to hear them out. You know, if you're a human being to them, I think that builds rapport, right? So empathy. Yes. You put that way more succinctly than I did. <laughs> For all those who couldn't hear, he said empathy. So, any other questions? Um, how do you do, uh, how do you practice this when you can only correspond with these uh, folks you're communicating with via email? I work with a lot of international partners, and so it's really hard to hop on a call and get messages across. Do you, how would you build rapport or overcome those challenges by being, creating only remote relationships? Ooh, that is a tough one. Because um, you already nicked the one thing that I normally would say is hop on a call with them and, you know, shoot the breeze, right? Um, I think that there needs to be probably more organized ways to get that interaction and build that rapport. Like if there are regular, maybe it's not a weekly thing, but like if you can get together with those folks somehow, uh, whether it is a Zoom call and it's, you know, you're just doing a trivia or like having a good time. Like there's different tools out there where you can get into different event pockets and connect with each other. We actually used to do that at Jupiter One, where it, Toucan would just put us in a, bubble and we just all just talk about random stuff. Um, if you can make the time to do that, that actually will go a long ways of building rapport with your uh, counterparts that you'll need to ask things from down the line. So I would say if there's a way to build in a program where you can just have time to connect with people instead of always having to work directly and ask them of something, um, that would be my recommendation. Find a way to connect with them outside of the job if you can. 
I think uh, we had a question up here also. There's a mic coming. Uh, how the best way do you know uh, the new audience? Sorry? How the best way for do you know a new audience? A you new... know a new audience, how to how to best way to to contact to him? Oh, uh, to me? Yes. Contact me? Yeah. Oh, I'm on LinkedIn. Oh, sorry. Uh, the best part to know a new a new audience. How to oh how to get to know your new audience? Yeah. Um there's different ways. So I for me I tend to try and pick it up as I go along as I meet people, right? What are their interests? How do they interact with you? Do they do your jokes land or do they not land? Um, the other way to do it is, you know, hey, you want to get to know the finance team? You're just doing, you're new to this company and you yeah, want to get to know a group. Just be like, hey, I'm just, if you have time, come on over. We're going to have a Zoom meeting, we're going to play a game, we're going to play code names, whatever, right? Just create an event where you can connect with people and just have a good time, um, whether it's remotely or in person. And you can do that either team-based or you can do that all at once and just pay attention to which person is on which team. Um, that's probably the most human way I would do it. There are other ways like that I know people might recommend surveys and stuff like that. What are, but I feel like you don't always get an authentic answer in, in a survey, right? It's very rote. Um, and so a lot of it is just being able to interact and pick up the cues from the people. So that's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So our next talk is going to come up. So thank you, Ashley. Thank you, everyone. everyone. And if you have any questions, Ashley will be here.